Anyway, I worked this all up, and I had a wonderful presentation and all these notes, and et cetera. And I sat down, and I guess last week, to time, to say blah, 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 and time. And then I realized that I had made what I consider some interesting readings into very dull dishwater. So what I want to do today is to open it up a bit. And I'll give a, a couple of minutes, a couple of minutes about the transformation. And then pose a problem of if this is the case for oral history, the way we talk about it today, how can we begin to analyze it? How can we begin to talk about the kinds of problems that are raised by the transformation that has taken place in oral history? And then proceed to, <clears throat> to talk about oral history as a genre, obviously, <clears throat> relying upon the work of my dear friend Samuel Portelli, but <clears throat> moving a little differently on that, you'll see. But the, so the first place I want to start is that part of that essay that I wrote on evidence for the handbook in oral history. I'm not particularly happy with that, and as I read it, reread it, I am increasingly unhappy with it. But it does pose for us the transformation of, from, of, in oral history. And I've described that transformation as a transformation from a concern for data to a concern with text. That when I began oral history, what our concern was, was to recreate the past. To ask people about what happened in the past. To gather data about what, ha what actually happened. And that was generally the attitude for most of the social sciences in doing interviews. It was a search for data. And if we, we were concerned with accuracy. If we talked about memory, we talked about memory as accuracy. How accurate was this memory? How could we test for the accuracy? How could we look at the interview in such a way as to understand how the interaction undermined the accuracy of memory or promoted the accuracy of memory? If, if we were interested in interpretation, the interpretation rested with the interviewer historian. People were, would provide us with information, and the interpretation would be ours. The power dynamic was, was in that sense, monopolistic, that the power rested with the historian who would collect the data and then interpret. Now, there were a couple of people who raised the question, well, maybe when people tell their histories, they're already interpreting, and maybe that's the first interpretation. Saul Benison, for those of you, if you read the essay, the, the uh, bibliography is all there in, in the essay, so I'm not going to mention these names. But <clears throat> in the it, 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 there was a, an attitude that the interviewer was withdrawn, and people were subjects and, of the interviewer, and the interviewer was contemplative. There was a distance relationship. And we talked about rapport, to be sure, but it was always how to manipulate that rapport in order to gain accurate <coughs> information about what happened in, in the past. <coughs> so there was the relationship was an unequal relationship and a distance relationship. In the 1970s, for any number of reasons, and we can get into them if you want to talk about them, some of them having to do with the experience of, of younger people coming into the field, some of the great, many of them having to do with how the new left found history of the working classes, which is an interesting question in and of itself, and a, a concern with culture, with cultural history, too. A number of people in different parts of the world began to talk about oral history as different. What makes oral history different and what makes it unique? And I believe that the first time, the first essay I've ever read by Sandro was in the history workshop, and I said something about what makes oral history unique. Is that the title? Well, my title was What Makes Oral History Different. Okay. Their <laughs> title was The Peculiarities of the Oral History. Pe right. I wonder why you were never given a title. I hate it. <laughs> right. Well, they're British. But, but you know, and if you, 
you read the essay that I wrote in uh, in Novel of Sound way back when, in 1972, I set forth a different way of looking at the, at the interview to see what the deeper structure of that interview was and how it was created in a dialogical process, in a process that was a joint creation. And Mike Frisch has called that a shared authority. But there was a different way of looking at the oral history examining it at, as a text. Not only were we interested in finding out what happened in the past, we were interested in how people organized their histories of the past, how people put together their stories. And we became interested in story. And we became interested in memory in a different way. And from cultural history, we picked up on memory as construction. Not memory as accuracy, but memory as construction. How do people now recreate a story or create a story about what happened in the past? So we became concerned with narrative. How do you analyze the narrative? Do we look at a narrative structurally? Do we look at a narrative in terms of the historical patterns of narrative? How do we understand this person who is telling us this story so that we can further understand the historical imagination at play. And, and so this, this is what I mean by the transformation. It's a totally different way of looking at the interview. And that's what that essay is attempting to do in its own way. And so I want to kind of open it up to you. If any of you have questions that we can fill in on about that transformation. 